The Docklands Light Railway in London's East End is operated by distinctive automatic driverless computer controlled trains which leapfrog over and around the regenerated docks, areas which have changed out of all recognition since the 1930s. This film, taken during an outing around the Thames some 60 years ago, captures the hustle and bustle of non-stop activity. The tugboats, barges, cranes and ships of all nations, reflecting London's preeminence as a major trading port. Changes, when they came, were rapid. By the mid-1970s, the container revolution had virtually emptied the port of London, with vessels using Tilbury and other ports around the country. Faced with miles of derelict quays and wharves, the London Docklands Development Corporation was set up by the government in 1981. Its brief was the complete regeneration of an area equal in size to the City of London. All the old Port of London Authority docks in the Isle of Dogs were to be swept away. But instead of the piecemeal rebuilding which had scarred the City of London with unsightly office blocks erected at random, a far-sighted and coordinated plan was envisaged, which would transfer the derelict, isolated area into one of the world's most exciting examples of urban regeneration. Transport was high on the agenda. A light railway or tramway was included, consisting of two routes serving the Isle of Dogs, one from the city and one from Stratford. So the Docklands Light Railway, or DLR, was born. Some sections of existing railway infrastructure would be used. This film, dating from 1962, shows the main BR line from Fenchurch Street. The tracks on the right later being utilised by the DLR. This is the former Lehman Street station site. Stepney East, and on the right, the path which the DLR will eventually take. This station was subsequently renamed Limehouse. Just to the right, the track of the North London Railway, which the DLR would take over for the line to Stratford. Down on the lower track, the remains of the Bow North London Railway Station. The DLR station, Bow Church, is on the other side of the bridge. This was South Bromley Station. Today, the DLR runs a frequent service on this track. The original light railway was constructed very quickly during 1985 and 1986. The rolling stock, which started to arrive at the systems depot at Poplar in August 1986, employed the latest technology in light rail vehicle design. Long articulated bodies with motors positioned in the end bogies. Operation would be automatic, with no drivers. The onboard staff, known as train captains, would monitor security, check tickets, and only, if necessary, drive the trains. Here, the second half of Unit 04 is seen arriving. This initial batch of 11 cars was manufactured in Germany and fitted with GEC electrical equipment. They were given the classification P86. 04 is pushed into the shed by a little diesel shunter, nicknamed Sooty. Unit 01, under manual control, has been on a test run to Stratford. The newly ballasted track had to be bedded in first by repeated running at constant speeds of 40 kilometers an hour. O1 heads north to Stratford again.
At this point, the line singles. In order to take the steeply angled curve, which brings the DLR alongside the main line into Stratford. Crossing the A102M road leading to and from the Blackwall Tunnel. The DLR terminus occupied a spare bay platform at Stratford, a major East London railway interchange point. Here passengers will transfer to and from main line and local trains as well as London Underground. This stretch of line will eventually require a loop and a passenger station at Pudding Mill Lane. Other tests included noise level evaluation and monitoring, especially on tight curves. Any new rail system has to be thoroughly tested to pass stringent safety requirements prior to opening to the public, and the DLR was no exception. The approaches to the original Poplar station, seen whilst just at platform level. between Cross Harbour and South Quay with more tight curves, demonstrating the advantages of light rail construction. Building work has now commenced on the many dockside sites, with new futuristic office blocks springing up everywhere. But many were also still in the planning stage. The Daily Telegraph building was one of the first to be occupied. The high bridge spanning the old West India docks. The ship to the right is the John Mackey, a former steam-driven cable-laying vessel, which it was hoped would be preserved, but unfortunately was eventually scrapped. Approaching the original Canary Wharf station, On the westbound leg now leading to the city, with platform clearance tests more usually carried out at night, O1 is hauled by Sooty. The professional preoccupation of the engineers contrasts with the reaction of local school children. A rare fall of snow offers an opportunity to try movements in adverse weather conditions. On March the 30th, 1987, number 11, the last of the first batch of trains, was delivered. This unit had quite an interesting career. In February 1987, it even worked in Manchester, fitted with a pantograph taking part in a light rail demonstration, making it the first DLR vehicle to carry members of the public. It later featured as the Royal Train during the official opening. In June 1987, an open day was held for staff, families and friends of the construction group GEC Molem. At Poplar, an excited crowd boards one of the trains for a preview of the DLR's network. One of the undoubted highlights of this very scenic journey is the high-level crossing over West India docks. A stop at the almost completed station at Canary Wharf. Interestingly, this never in fact opened. Lamps were not even fitted because by then, plans for an entirely new, larger station had been approved. Approaching the terminus at Island Gardens, viewed from nearby Millwall Park. Today, the future of this station is uncertain, and if an underground extension of the DLR across the river is opened, it would be made redundant. Two trains on the hub of the DLR's three lines at North Quay Junction. 
Riding over track later to be removed during reorganisation of this junction. Also, rare views of the original stations around Canary Wharf, now completely redeveloped. At Poplar Depot, movements of stock in multiple unit formation, an indication of things to come. By now, following intensive running and testing, wheels had to be turned. These bogies have just come back from the workshops of the Tyne and Weir Metro in Newcastle. This train is on the top of the North Quay Junction, on the little used track connection. As 1987 progressed, building works increased with the DLR trains mingling with a sea of cranes and imposing structures. Flags and bunting mark the official royal opening of the system on the 30th of July, 1987. In Poplar Depot, number 11 receives a final spit and polish. At Island Gardens, crowds greeted Her Majesty the Queen as she inspected the station area. Above, number 11 proudly awaits its royal passengers. A month later came the public opening on the 31st of August 1987. Many railway enthusiasts gathered in the early morning gloom at Poplar to await the inaugural train. And welcome to this first train. Could we ask people who are standing please not to stand in the doorway area on the red part of the floors. The doors open into that area and you may get caught. If you can stand in the centre aisle and use the grab rails please. And hold tight, these are high performance vehicles. Thank you. On board the first DLR passenger train. Here it stops at the remains of the original Canary Wharf station. Heron Keys. A good view of the original folding style doors, which were later deemed to be inadequate when handling capacity loads. Tower Gateway. The narrow island platforms will soon prove insufficient with the railway operating at full capacity. Near South Quay Station, the trains curve between the tall buildings. Island Gardens is thronged with people, many of whom will have walked through the foot tunnel from the south side of the Thames. Towards the end of this opening day, passengers disperse and the train captains ease their aching feet. The Docklands Light Railway was now an integral part of London's transport network. Bank Station was selected to be the new city terminus. This artist's impression shows the planned station, 42 metres below street level. To reach Bank, the DLR would be extended from near Tower Gateway on a steep incline at Royal Mint Street, pass under the moat of the Tower of London, then Great Tower Street and King William Street. The main construction site was to be at Royal Mint Street. Here, a very steep cutting was started by the contractors Edmund Nuttall Limited in March 1988. Initially, a small pilot tunnel was cut by hand. In very wet and damp conditions, miners dug out the clay and fitted small concrete linings. 
The tunnel boring machine was of German design but British manufacture. It weighed 100 tonnes and could carve out the correct size tunnel later. Meanwhile on the DLR, traffic increased with development of the Docklands estate. Increasing numbers of workers using the light railway. Because of their computer controls, trains still paused at the site of Canary Wharf Station. The last of the old warehouses, whilst awaiting demolition, housed a television studio. Visually, the area continued to alter rapidly. Here, three huge, gigantic office blocks, each of 55 storeys high, will further dwarf the DLR. It had become increasingly obvious that a major station was needed at Canary Wharf, and that the whole of the railway would require urgent upgrading to cope with the thousands of additional passengers. Plans were drawn up to swiftly double the lengths of trains and platforms. A few months later, travelling from South Quay, the sheer scale of the new buildings is apparent. Like several others, Poplar Station will also have to be enlarged to accommodate the extra traffic, but also eventually the planned extension eastwards to Beckton. From the roadside, a temporary opportunity to get some low angle shots of trains travelling to and from Stratford. North Quay Junction was as busy as usual. More old warehouses await their fate. Sequences now covering the construction of the underground section of the DLR, which will bring trains into the heart of the city. Note the path of the diversionary track leading to Bank. Excavation of the westbound tunnel had reached about two-thirds of the way on the two kilometres to Bank when these scenes were taken. Spoil was brought out by specially designed lorries that entered into the end of the tunnel boring machine itself. Returning lorries carried in concrete linings. more new linings. A giant suction pad picks them up and puts them into a section of the machine which will place them in situ on the newly dug sides of the tunnel. At the cutting face, a single claw slices through the clay. Glimpses of flint can be seen. At a location just behind the mansion house, work was halted to enable archaeologists to examine some finds at the bottom of the shaft. Items of Roman origin were discovered, including the foundations of a jewellery shop. Any such excavation work is always likely to unearth evidence of London's historic past.
To handle the railway's growing traffic, more rolling stock was ordered. Ten trains, 12 to 21, were constructed at the BREL works at York, one of which is depicted being moved round to the test track. Runs with the new stock, classified P89, were made on this short siding, trains being operated manually and automatically. The first of the new cars to leave York for the journey south was Unit 12 in December 1989. On the bank extension, the westbound tunnel was now complete and apart from some minor work, had reached the station shell at Bank. The westbound tunnel and station shell were now used for the removal of spoil, as work proceeded on the eastbound tunnel and the station complex. This will be the head shunt in which trains will reverse for the return journey. In the main access tunnel between the platforms, a temporary narrow gauge railway brings in materials. Construction continues on the eastbound station shell. However, it will be a further two years before the DLR extension opens to the public. Further construction work was already underway as part of the upgrading process. This involved major changes at North Quay Junction. The original West India Quay station will also be replaced. Travelling from South Quay, the massive Canary Wharf development is now nearly finished. start has been made on the new station being constructed. This will have three tracks served by six platform faces. Poplar has been stripped down to platform level in readiness for its rebuilding. To cater for the many additional trains, a reversing siding has been installed at Cross Harbour. Passenger traffic having exceeded estimates by over a third as nearby offices open for business, more rolling stock was required. This train is one of the B90 class which was manufactured in Belgium. Note the emergency door in the ends which has displaced the single window on the earlier stock. The original 1986 units were not allowed to use the bank extension as they were not built with the requisite safety features. However, this stock did still work to Tar Gateway. Eventually, most will be sold to other operators. A month before the public opening of the bank extension, many crew training trips were made. However, only the westbound track was yet in use. Units of P89 stock arrive at Bank. These have the original fold back doors. All were rebuilt with a single sliding door. At this stage, the trains were still confined to the westbound tunnel only.
Fuse in the station control room at bank, with the staff checking up on corridor lighting. The eastbound platform was still incomplete. This unit is a B90, one of the third batch of cars. Note the new sliding doors. At Shadwell, the new extended platforms can be seen on the 29th of July 1991, the public opening day of the Underground Link. At Bank, the two-year improvement program has provided bright, airy connections to the Northern Line. The main corridor was enlarged by removing iron segments. On opening day, staff were on hand to assist passengers looking for the DLR platforms. A privileged visit now into the head shunt where the twin tunnels join together to form a single reversing spur with extra capacity to store an out-of-service train. From the westbound platform, the first of the Belgium-built B90s, number 22, is about to depart. Everyone enjoys the upfront view and the seats are soon occupied. By now, the new station serving Canary Wharf is half finished. Trains only stopping for building workers. Following massive demolition, West India Quay Station seems marooned in space, but not for long. It too will close, but will be rebuilt and reopened. Simultaneously, construction of the new 8.5 km extension eastwards to Beckton was underway, the contractors being Balfour Beatty and Molam Taylor Woodrow. This was to be the location of the DLR Canning Town Station alongside Bow Creek. Building work was actually started and platforms put in. And it was also proposed to have a new BR station adjoining, providing a useful interchange point with the North London Line, running from Richmond to North Woolwich via Stratford. However, the decision to sanction extension of the Jubilee Line into East London altered these original plans. Eventually, a new joint station will cater for all three railways, the DLR, Jubilee and North London Link. Wintry conditions at Stratford, with service as normal on the DLR. The 23 B90s already in service had been built at the giant BN plant in Belgium. They were followed by an additional 47 vehicles classified as B92, B standing for Beckton as opposed to P for Poplar on the original 22 units. In the spring of 1992, new trams for Amsterdam were in the yard. And here, a DLR train is on its way to the BN test track. Note the pantographs. Thirty-five was the first to be fitted with a new higher capacity signalling system which will be used on the Beckton line and eventually the rest of the network as part of its ongoing modernisation. First West India Quay station has vanished to be remodelled with two island platforms serving four tracks. At Bank, the eastbound platform was now in service, opening in November 1991, allowing trains to arrive and depart from separate platforms.
Here, the same train swings onto the new alignment to reach North Quay Junction and West India Quay Station. West India Quay Station has by now reopened. Coming into view the gleaming splendour of Canary Wharf Station. Maps were now appearing on the railway showing the Beckton extension scheduled to open in 1994. Sliding doors have been fitted to the older P89 stock, replacing the folding in doors. As some body reconstruction work was involved, the contract went to the BREL works at Derby. The Beckton extension was to be built by the Docklands Corporation as part of its redevelopment of the Royal Group of Docks. A section of the original 1985 planned alignment to Beckton was replaced by a diversion around the loop of the River Lee to serve the station at Canning Town. Prior to its public opening, an open day was organised for family, friends and staff, enabling them to ride from Poplar to Beckton on this sunny March day in 1994. As the railway was not then operational at weekends, the depot was full of trains. Note the different roof lines with the older P stock on the left and the newer B stock on the right. In the new large control room, the track diagram showed only trains on the Beckton extension. All stations have security TV cameras. Just across the way is the newly built Poplar station which included a temporary terminus for the Beckton line. Leaving in approximately one minute. The new eight and a half kilometre line runs eastwards, passing the existing route to Stratford. Its first few stations are on the viaduct. In some sections, new business and office blocks have gone up. However, reflecting the economic slump of the early 1990s, there was a sparsity of new buildings, and stretches of semi-derelict wasteland could be seen around the former royal group of docks.
At Canning Town, the tracks descend to ground level and the line follows the curve of the River Lee. The quiet light rail vehicles at this photogenic S-bend contrast with the constant din from the adjacent trunk road. This was to have been the site of the original Canning Town station. A short branch had once been proposed to serve London City Airport, where traffic had increased by 50% due to the use of small jet engine planes. Continuing east, the DLR dives below street level for the next two stations. A wide, spacious, circular layout obliterates dark corners, thereby aiding security and surveillance. The actual station is set in the middle of a roundabout above. The public opening on March the 28th, 1994, was wet and windy, and at Poplar, few people turned up. On an early journey, the train captain chats to a passenger and hands her a complimentary ticket, valid for the first four days of operation. At Custom House Station, some of the warehouses are still standing, but today it is hard to picture these docks at the height of their power. The official first train arrives at Beckton. Amongst the dignitaries, the Secretary of State for the Environment, John Gummer, who is to perform the opening ceremony. In 1995, traffic to Beckton is light. But when the current recession ends, it is hoped the old dock areas will be successfully developed and the city airport will have flights all day instead of just in the mornings and evenings. It is eventually planned to operate a connecting shuttle bus to the DLR. Returning now to Poplar and passing the site of the new station at Pudding Mill Lane due to open at the end of 1995 travelling out to Canning Town and the huge earthworks are for the joint station being built. The DLR train slows due to recent subsidence caused by the excavations. In order to house the enlarged fleet, a depot was opened at Beckton on part of the site of a former gas works. The depot possesses comprehensive maintenance facilities with pits giving access to all underfloor equipment. There is also wheel turning gear removing the necessity to send the bogies away. The Beckton control room has the usual track diagrams. A separate track is used for testing the automatic signalling equipment. 
a train can run up and down for most of the day. The original 11 cars have been sold to Essen in Germany. Rebuilt and fitted with pantographs, they operate on the Essen network but still in their distinctive DLR livery. The folding back doors are still used but re-engineered. In two decades, the Docklands have undergone a radical transformation. Giant buildings shimmer in the spring sunshine. From the 50th floor of Canary Wharf Tower, the full impact of the redevelopment and the role played by the DLR can be appreciated, fully justifying the foresight of the early planners. Developments are already underway for an extension south of the river to Lewisham and in the future other proposals may come to fruition. Building the extension to Lewisham proved a major undertaking. It involved closing two high-level stations at Mudshoot and Island Gardens and a drastic change of level to take the tracks down below the River Thames. Then south of the river, a steep rise to join existing mainline railways at Greenwich and Lewisham. This journey from the city to the Isle of Dogs shows the huge construction sites underway. This is the future low-level mud chute station and the tunnel which will speed the trains under the Thames. The main contractors were the Balfour Beatty Group. Scenes taken during the final weeks of the old high-level stations at Mud Chute and Island Gardens. Only this platform had been in use for some time. Meanwhile, at Canary Wharf, London Underground have been constructing a huge new station to cope with the expected increase in passengers. When opened in 2000, Canary Wharf was one of the largest underground stations in the world. Passengers descend into a spacious booking hall. Then under that, the lofty, wide platform area. At Lewisham Mainline Station, the construction of the DLR platforms are well underway. The last week of trains on the high-level stations at Mudshoot and Island Gardens. Island Gardens closed on the 8th of January 1999. A special train was run for the benefit of journalists and staff. I represent everyone on the train with a special limited edition print of our Island Garden station. This was the very last train to use the two stations before they were demolished. After Mud Chute, the special inches its way into the unused platform at Island Gardens. Excellent. Whilst in the other platform, the last service train. Special prepares to leave. Jim Connor from the London Railway and Record Magazine. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the very, very last train from Island Gardens High Level. Tonight is its very last night. The DLR liveried bus covered the closed section.
the new mud chute station and above it on the old alignment a works train arrives to start removing the track. Meanwhile, trains are reversing at Cross Harbour. The new line can be seen on the left. By now, the new station complex at Canning Town has been completed. Bus station, the railway to North Greenwich, the DLR, and the Jubilee Underground Line. The Lewisham extension opened ahead of schedule, well in time for the Millennium Exhibition at the nearby Dome. Mudchute New Station. This film was taken during its first week in service. The remains of the high-level viaduct next to the new Island Garden station. The old station site, now a hole in the ground. Inside Island Gardens. A week after the extension opened, the next station, Cutty Sark, has yet to be completed. This train will not stop at the next station. This train is not stopping for the station, Cutty Sark. Well, you know, there's a, there's a panto on tomorrow down in Greenwich Village. approaching Greenwich station. Here DLR trains have a very convenient cross-platform connection with the mainline railway. Deptford Bridge. Bridge of six control. Can you tell me if it's still lead EDP from Island Gardens down to Ocean Road? This is situated over a very busy trunk road, the A2. The line then passes through a more tranquil area by the park and river. Built in a side road, this station is surrounded by housing. Approaching Lewisham.
Lewisham is a very busy junction with trains of all types travelling in all directions. Down below, the DLR trains return to the Isle of Dogs. This station, very near Stratford, opened much later. Although situated in a heavily industrial area, it sees relatively few passengers. In recent years, the line to Beckton has benefited from increased new housing and other developments. The train to North Woolwich dips to take the tunnel under the old docks, while the DLR trains are at a high level enjoying a fine view of the city airport. This is now very busy with movements taking place all day and many more airlines using the facilities. future extension from here will bring passengers directly to the airport terminal. Heron Quay station was closed in order that considerable building work could go on around it. Trains pass under the construction and train staff keep an eye open for swinging cranes. bank station, the different liveries can add to a traveller's enjoyment. For a short while, television monitors were installed in a few trains as an experiment to provide information and advertising but they have all since been removed. The Docklands Light Railway has been an unqualified success, playing a vital role in the development of the former London docks. Now it forms an essential and integral part of the transport network serving East London, both north and south of the river.